So if you lose some tape oh, or something, good. I just call on us. That's please. great. Thank you. Thank you very much for talking with me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, please do. First time I've ever interviewed a president. So if I pass out, <laughs> just <laughs> revive <Ooh>. me. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you if there was any one thing that brought home has brought home to you the awesomeness of the office, like whether it was the hotline or Air Force One, or the Situation Room, or any, a thing that made you realize the power and the awesomeness of the Well, it wouldn't, I don't know whether it reminded me of awesomeness or power or something, but early on, uh, I had an experience that, uh, if you're interested, uh, made me aware that I ought to be a little careful about what I said or did. Mm -hmm. uh, we were invited down to James J. Kilpatrick, Jack Kilpatrick's home down in Virginia for a Sunday lunch. Mm -hmm. And the helicopter took us off the lawn here in about 35 minutes or so. We were at his farm, landed. And in walking to the house, Jack was telling me about uh, uh, how they'd been there for a few days putting in the phones. Mm -hmm. Well, this was a surprise to me. And I said, wait, the phones? And then he told me that I could reach anyone in the world and so forth from there. And I said, well, <clears throat> you mean, you know, just <laughs> to have lunch a half an hour away from the mm -hmm. White House, they have to put, well, I guess it's true, they do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for whatever might happen. Mm -hmm. But he was telling me that he didn't believe them when they were putting in the phones that they could reach anyone in the world, and he was kind of, and they said, well, name someone. Well, he had a son who was on guard at an embassy in the military at the, uh, in Africa. Mm -hmm. And they got the son on the phone, and his mother got to talk to him and so forth. So he had another son who was an enlisted man, a quartermaster on the USS Pratt. Mm -hmm. And he asked, well, okay, what about him? They, the Pratt was in the Mediterranean. And they had to say to him, no, they couldn't get him because the fleet was on maneuvers. Mm -hmm. And when the fleet was on maneuvers, only the White House mm -hmm. could reach them. Mm -hmm. How Wait, about, well, I should ask you, how about the hotline? Maybe? Well, I was going to say, but wait a minute, he told me this. and. Uh, when we got inside, I met the young man's wife, the one that was on the destroyer. Mm -hmm. Very lovely young lady and hadn't seen her husband for months. I went back out, said to these fellows, is this true that I could reach someone on the USS Pratt? And they said, oh yes, sir. And I said, well, get him. So and I went back in and got her. And she got to talk to her husband. Gosh. I hadn't really thought the thing through very much. Mm -hmm until I got a letter from him, a young man, and he told me what it was like when the fleet was on maneuvers, how I hadn't even thought about that the last part of that call has got to go by air, that the air is full of radio traffic, ships talking to ships, admirals talking to admirals, and then a voice on the air said, White House calling, and he said, someone said, what code is that? And someone else says, well, maybe it is the White House. And he said even Hollywood couldn't have silenced the air as quickly as that was silenced. And so the phone call went through. And of course, it must have been pretty public <laughs> with the whole fleet yeah. listening yeah. in. And in his letter, he then said this line. He said, it was as if God had called the Vatican and asked for an altar boy by name. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, it suddenly, it, believe me, it sobered me a little bit to discover that I could just say this and then all of this could happen. Mm -hmm. And I, I was almost scared to death of what I might have done to the fleet maneuvers. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you that. Now, you're not going to tell me anything about the hotline, huh? Is it right by your bed? Well, there are hotlines everywhere that I am. Is it red? Um, some, but not always. Mm -hmm. uh, the. Uh, as a matter of fact, a number of them are, uh, are black phones, and um, I, it isn't uh, it isn't uh, just a phone that is used for emergency at all. It's it's used quite a bit. It's an embassy can be calling, and knowing that uh, calls are really monitored, that 
they're not very secure, they use that instead. So it's a secure line? Right? Yes, it's a secure line, is what it really is. I wanted to ask you when things are going badly, or if you've had to wrestle with a difficult problem, or if you've heard of a great tragedy like San Lebanon, um, what you do to find serenity? Well, there are many things of that kind. That the murder of that fine young officer down in El Salvador, the tragedy, of course, in Beirut of our embassy was you you can't help but feel those things personally. Mm -hmm. And I guess you just have to say what I've tried to say sometimes to the family of someone. And that is you just have to believe in God's mercy and Do you find you might go for a walk or that, you know, go, you might go riding or just to reestablish your own harmony? Well, you, you can't just do that so much because of the schedule depends on where you are mm -hmm. and when something has happened. Um, I must say that the going for a ride is something that I have, uh, whether it's in connection with a tragedy, that kind is something that I have always found very beneficial. Mm -hmm. Writing has been a very definite part of my life. Why? I mean, I don't know. I, I can't tell you. I only know that, uh, you know, I couldn't say, well, I was raised in a farm uh, at all. In fact, I was grown up and out of college be, uh, before I actually took up writing. But all I know is that without having any experience or exposure to it or not knowing people that rode back there in a small town in Illinois, an even smaller town where I went to college, I only know that I had increasingly in my uh, days, particularly in college now, a desire to horseback ride. Mm -hmm. Because you liked communicating with the horse? I, I just, I don't know what it was. Mm -hmm. Nature. And uh, then when I uh, got a radio, I was a sports announcer, and there were uh, there were a couple of people at the studio that rode. Uh, just go out and rent a horse at a riding academy and ride. Mm -hmm. uh, I went with them, mm -hmm. but there was another fellow at the state at the studio who was a reserve officer in the cavalry. Mm -hmm. And in Des Moines, Iowa, at that time, the 14th Cavalry was stationed at Fort Des Moines, and there was a program between the two World Wars, World War One and Two in which you could enlist as a candidate for a commission in I, reserve. You did, in, you, you did enlist. In, what? You were in the cavalry, right? Uh, as a reserve officer. Mm -hmm. This enlistment is only then, at the same time you apply mm -hmm. to be a candidate, so you are not uh, right, now, I have to ask you another yet. question. I have to ask you the question. Yeah. Like, um, how you enjoy life, what you do to cheer yourself up, now whether it's uh, having a really good glass of wine or sitting next to a beautiful woman, or walking through a field of flowers, what what might be something that you do to enjoy life? Well, uh, I live for the days that we can get to our ranch in California mm -hmm. and back to ranching and uh, riding. The routine is usually the same. Um, ride in the morning, Nancy and I ride. Um, and the afternoon is spent uh, with uh, all the things that uh, need doing, uh, whether it's uh, restoring the supply of firewood because the only heat we have at the ranch is two fireplaces, mm -hmm. or whether it's uh, uh, going down and clearing trails again, they get overgrown, the riding trails, and you have to go through and uh, pruning them out, cleaning mm -hmm. them out, things of that kind. I had one question on um, what do you think about when you chop wood? The wood? <laughs> it's, it's very satisfying. You know, the, uh, such a sense of accomplishment when you see the pile grow. But uh, other things, right now, we're, we'll be going to the ranch uh, uh, shortly, and uh, I've picked another place uh, that I think ought to be fenced. And uh, the fences that I have, that I started with up there, are made out of telephone poles. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will be building about 400 feet of telephone mm -hmm. pole fence. And, and what's your greatest, this is probably the same thing, what's your idea of heaven? on earth? 
<laughs> being at the ranch. Yeah. Um, but that part of the question you said about sitting beside a beautiful woman, well, yes, that's very much a part of my life as long as she's Nancy. Yeah. And, uh, that's very nice. Um, I want to ask you a question about, uh, sort of a word association. In, in a few words, what qualities you admire in leaders? In what? In a leader. And I had some ideas of leaders, like just a few words, what qualities you might admire in a leader. And let's say somebody like FDR. Is there like a few words that you just think of off the top of your head that you admire about him? Well, in those days, uh, I was a New Deal Democrat. Mm -hmm. In fact, the first vote I ever cast was cast for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But any kind of quality things about him? That, like yes, him? there's no question, but that he came in at a time when uh, there was no previous experience in our history to, uh, to give any leads as to what you did then. Uh, people who did not experience the Great Depression and have only heard it compared to recessions that we've had since the war and the present recession and so forth, cannot understand what it was like there were no programs of such things as unemployment insurance. Okay, you know or all these like leaders that. that I have here, these few words. <laughs> I also have, like, if you had a few words on what you admired about someone like, say, LBJ or Jimmy Carter. These are like predecessors, men who sat here. If, they're, if this is a dumb question you don't want to answer, that's okay. Well, I think you learn and you have to say about any of them. They learned in here that um, Harry Truman's line is right. That can't turn and look over your shoulder for somebody to mm -hmm. pass the decision on to. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you um, what you like least about the job. I think that would have to be the today because of the world we live in, the features of it that make you uh, a group wherever you go. Uh, it's hard to remember that there was a time when uh, a president maybe had one or two Secret Service agents with him. Uh, there are things that you don't feel free to do anymore because of the discomfort you cause to others. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, we don't go to church as often as we would like uh, anymore. Do you remember the song, um, the, the Secret Service that makes me nervous? when Mary Martin was here. Oh, I had and never heard that song before. And that sort of summed it up, you know, they're looking and they, the daughter yeah. can't even kiss her boyfriend, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it isn't so much that I must say they're wonderful about not imposing themselves on you. It's the knowledge that, uh, well, for example, uh, I don't know how a president anymore could go to the first ball game and throw the ball out, as they used to do. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you provide security with 50,000 people or 100,000 people around you. Mm -hmm. um, and as I say, like going to church, you know that you can't help but be a disruptive influence uh, in what should be an hour of worship. Mm -hmm. So there are things that you just have to rule out. And what you know. do you like the best about living in the house? Living in this house? In the White House? Mm -hmm. Well, there is there is no question. There is a great feeling of the history of, of this home and uh, who has lived there before, but it is also most gracious and comfortable living. Mm -hmm. Is um, it the most gracious and comfortable living you've experienced? Well, you would have to say that mm -hmm. with the, uh, all that is, uh, is provided there. The, there's a wonderful feeling about the people who work in the White House. There is such an esprit de corps. Their, their pride mm -hmm. in being a part of that institution that um, is very heartwarming From to Mike Deaver that you wonder about what present you'll give a manicurist. And you know, you're very careful yourself to return, to give back to the pot whatever you're taking out of it. That, that, you know, what that you you're mean? careful to thank people for the little things that they do for you. That was well, much appreciated. I want to ask you how you pace yourself. Uh, well, I've uh, maybe it's the experience of having been governor for eight years. Uh, I've often wondered 
what this job must be like for someone who hadn't had that same experience. The, and by this without in any way meaning to demean the Congress or the Senate, uh, that cannot be as much the same experience as having been governor. As a matter of fact, I think that being a governor in, in this country is the closest thing uh, to the presidency. I think as a governor, I read that you took cat naps occasionally. You knew just how to pace yourself, how to take advantage of no, five minutes. No, I, I, I don't take cat naps, but I, uh, uh, I sleep well, so I, uh, I'm an eight-hour uh, mm -hmm. uh, fellow a night uh, in sleep. Uh, I've got a little period of exercise. I've always uh, enjoyed staying fit. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, I want to ask you the five most interesting people that you've met, or among the five most interesting oh. people. Could be any leader or... Oh my, it would have to be among. Yeah, I have among. met by now how many heads of state I... I but you know, it might be you, you know, your wife's father, or it might be an actor. For, just whoever comes to mind is like among the five very interesting people. Well, you should, have, you should have given me some advance warning on that. I mean, if you're going back over the entire life. Uh, uh, Maybe I could say yes. off the top of your head. I could say that a, a most unforgettable man uh, that I have ever met was the program director that gave me my first job in radio, mm -hmm. uh, Peter MacArthur. Anyone else you can think of? Well, uh, let me just say a word or two about him. Peter MacArthur uh, was from the time I first met him, almost totally crippled from arthritis. Uh, I met him when he was on two canes. I saw him go to two crutches. Um, and, of course, eventually bedridden and died. But this man was the first man that anyone would seek out if they had troubles. Uh, I don't know how to describe it, but he was, and, and I don't mean that he was sanctimonious mm -hmm. or anything of that kind. He was a rough, tough former vaudeville, and he came to this country from Scotland uh, with Harry Lauder's troop. All right, now wait, okay, now, I mean, that's a wonderful answer. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, if nothing to do with politics, but if there are any um, heads of state who you've met, who you feel a sort of a simpatico with, that you think, if it were another life and time, this guy and I would really be good friends. A great many. Now, whether it's the fact that we have the same job and the same problems, I don't know. But I do know that there is a kind of an immediate bond. And for example, when Sadat mm -hmm. was assassinated, he had been here. Now, you're only together for a couple of days on a visit, a state visit of that kind. But when that tragedy occurred, Nancy and I were both amazed that suddenly we realized that our, our sorrow was not that of, of just the tragedy of the event and the great man that had been wiped out. It was personal, mm -hmm. that we felt a personal sense of loss mm -hmm. of a friend. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing it could happen so quickly. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it's intense. I would imagine living here is very intense. You know, you have In things of that kind, mm -hmm. yes. Incidentally, and among most interesting people and admired people in my life also was the Prime Minister of England, uh, Margaret Thatcher. Mm -hmm. Any certain quality about her that you, you know, whether it's grit or moxie? Or it's... Um, well, it's courage, mm -hmm. uh, forthrightness, uh, dedication. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you um, how you define um, a civilized man, what you think are the qualities going to be the same. Well, someone once defined a gentleman mm -hmm. as someone who always says and does the kindest thing. Mm -hmm. So you did, that would be the same? Yeah. Who do you think um, that you've met who personifies a, gen a gentleman? 
oh, I think I've met a, a great many. Um, the, well, the gentleman that I just mm -hmm. mentioned, uh, uh, a teacher I once had, uh, B.J. Fraser. In uh, college? In high school. Mm -hmm. What did he teach? Uh, English, and he was the director of the plays, mm -hmm. the high school plays, which I participated. I mean, was he a gentleman because he always stood up for a lady, or because he opened the door? Or no, he was. It was again. There was a. Uh, there was a, a a real kindness about him. There was a. Helpfulness in. Uh, he was one of those unusual teachers that came to a school and suddenly uh, uh, he had a constituency mm -hmm. in the student body. I wanted to ask you how you feel about Mrs. Reagan. Well, uh, I once described that a number of years ago as uh, how do you describe what it feels like to come in out of the cold into mm -hmm. a warm room. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I can't conceive of being without her. And how do you like her to look? I mean, my husband will say, I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I find I always like the way she looks. And what do you find most attractive in a woman? Here, <laughs> um, I. How do I describe that? I guess being womanly. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to tell me you're a leg man. <laughs> <laughs> you know whether there's any, you know whether it's eyes or you know, it, a laugh or. You, I just, I know that there are a great many women who wouldn't believe me of this, but I'm a great fan of your sex. Oh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not questioning that. It's not a trick question. No. It's, it's a real, it, um, I know this is the wrong time to ask, but this doesn't come out until November, and by November uh, that'll all be behind you. Listen. Yeah. Behind me, that, uh, I regret very much that the stories that have come out about that are unfairly casting well, yeah. on the on the women because I couldn't have asked for a warmer, more gracious uh, reception mm -hmm. than I had uh, and just one woman is now being taken as No, the, I don't want to get I don't want to I don't want to yeah. put you in the defense of that because I don't think you're gonna have any problem with that one when the comes <laughs> to the show. Um, I wanted to ask you oh setting aside the political aspects of this question um, what effect do you think you've had on the attitude of the American people towards themselves and towards their country? I, I don't know how to say this now without, I don't want it to sound as if I think I did this enough, but I think that there has been a restoration of patriotism, of pride in country, and of optimism about our country uh, in, these, in these few years. Mm -hmm. I think that Americans, after a lot of self-doubts that some of them were brought on by the Vietnam Syndrome, um, some were brought on by uh, economic problems and all, but suddenly there is a can-do spirit that we always used to have and just took for granted. Uh, I think I'm more proud of, than of almost anything the extent to which the private sector, the people themselves, whether it's at a community level, uh, in a union, in a corporation, uh, uh, or just a neighborhood, have moved voluntarily to resolve some of the problems that we face today. We have a computer here now. We have a private sector initiative office, and we have a computer with more than 3,000 programs in that computer that are programs that we have located and found that people are doing something for themselves out there in the community, uh, or as I say, in, uh, in associations that have gotten together of various kinds to resolve virtually every type of 
economic or social problems you could think of. I wanted to ask you what you do for luck. If you have any leprechauns you ever appeal to. Uh, you know, for luck? Mm -hmm. Oh, I knock on wood. <laughs> you know, you've got to remember that show business is the very center of superstition. Mm -hmm. You know, don't whistle in the dressing room. Mm -hmm. uh, don't throw your hat on the bed and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, I'm not superstitious. I just knock on wood and don't throw my hat on the bed <laughs> <laughs> or whistle in the dressing room. But I wanted to ask you, um, I, I read that you don't like to fly, that it makes you feel claustrophobic, and I wondered if it was easier on Air Force One. Oh. <clears throat> I have to tell you, the flying, not flying, was not the result of any fear or not liking it or anything else. Maybe it came from coming out of World War II, a lot of us, even though I'd never heard a shot fired in anger. Uh, I had served at a fluid desk for the Air Force. I just, don't ask me why, I got a hunch that I would get in the wrong plane. And so I just didn't. And I uh, was even in the contract for eight years of my television program with General Electric mm -hmm. that I would not fly. And uh, when I finally gave in and told some people who were after me to do it that I would run for governor, I knew that I would have to. Mm -hmm. And I did. And I, uh, no, I'm not uncomfortable at all. And j jet lag? Do you do anything to prevent jet lag? Oh, that, uh, I don't know. You try. But uh, believe me, I know about jet lag now. I know that it's easier to go west than it is to go east. Mm -hmm. uh, like bring your own pillow or anything like that? Uh, no, it just, I think you just have to uh, let yourself get, get used to it mm -hmm. and uh, wait for it to take over. And I wanted to, add, I've got a few favorite questions. Can you All just right. take a second? Um, your favorite room in the White House? Favorite room in the White House? Um, oh, golly. Um, we have a very lovely living quarters there and a very lovely bedroom. And I have a study, a private study. I'll tell you what. The one that I spend the least time in but really get the most satisfaction out of is a room that we've made into a gym, and every day I have about a 15-minute workout there. Your favorite White House meal? There, I couldn't pick. I have to tell you that um, <laughs> the food <laughs> is excellent. Yes, it, uh, I can't remember any that I didn't like or approve of. Do you like any, um, do you like a game like poker or any game of high stakes or risk or chance? It's been so long since I've played any kind of cards um, that I, I just don't have any uh, leaning or desire. Uh, any to, material thing that you have that gives you the most pride? The what? A material thing that gives you the most pride. Oh dear. The ranch. Mm -hmm. Do you prefer state dinners or small private dinners? Well, I think for sheer pleasure, you prefer the small private dinner. Uh, to be with some friends and uh, to have a dinner of that kind. But I must say this, uh, uh, Nancy is the head honcho in the state dinners, and uh, I have found them uh, uh, most delightful. And any favorite time in history? That, I mean, as a history buff, is there any favorite time in history that you would yes, like to read about? Yes, there is. I, uh, the, that early West period and the, uh, the uh, cavalry in the West time, I think that uh, that is, is the closest thing to uh, Britain's uh, Kipling time of uh, the Burma frontier and so forth, that uh, the thing that we have, and it has a, a romance to it that most countries cannot match. Uh, there isn't anything comparable to it other than that, let's say, the Burma frontier with the, uh, for the British. That's great. That's interesting. I've appreciated this so much. I'm sorry I 
had to go along, but because everything you said, I would like to listen to everything, but I had so many things <laughs> I know. in my agenda. Know. 20 minutes yeah. is too short to get to me. Let me just go back to something great, I wanted to great. where you were Please talking do. about the, uh, and I was talking about the president, whether the pressure or not, and where I said that maybe being governor was part of it. When I first became governor, and it was in almost like the same situation here, California had, uh, was really in an emergency situation, budget-wise and things of that kind. And it seemed as if every day, someone, when I came in in the morning, was almost immediately standing in front of my desk saying, we have a problem. And uh, we were in discovering all these. And I got, actually, I remember something that had happened when I was president of the Screen Actors Guild at the time of the first great strike that uh, had ever hit our motion picture industry. That was right after World War II. And it was a jurisdiction strike, and that was a time when there was a real communist effort and domination of some unions and an effort to infiltrate and take over the business. And I found myself almost like that looking over the shoulder thing. I, I was conscious that, that the members of the ship of the guild uh, would more or less accept what I recommended. But that was frightening too, because I thought, wait, who am I to make decisions mm -hmm. for all these thousands of people? How do I know that I'm right? And one night I just said to myself, all I can do is to the best of my ability, considering everything, did make a decision based on what I honestly believe in my heart is the right thing to do. And uh, I began sleeping again. Yeah, yeah. And I thought of that when I became governor and uh, suddenly things changed. Mm -hmm. There is another little element involved there. Lincoln explained it very well. He said, I would be the stupidest man on this footstool called Earth if I thought for one minute I could face the duties that confront me here if I could not turn to someone wiser and stronger mm -hmm. and ask for help. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much. Thank well, you. I sure have enjoyed it. Well, is, this a, is this a, a California gold nugget? Yes. How did you guess? But it, it looks like it's the state of California. Except but. that it is a nugget just as it came out of the river. Oh, no kidding. In the Columbia River out there, the Columbia, what do I mean? No, in Columbia, California, the uh, Tuolumne River, Tuolumne. the, the uh, skin divers still go up there on weekends and dive in the river and come up with nuggets and there are little jewelry stores along oh, the shore so. there where they make things out of this jewelry and all. And one of those skin divers found this nugget shaped like the state of California yeah. and uh, gave it to me and I had it made at one of those places into a tie Isn't that nice? So, uh, Isn't it, that great? That's really amazing because it looks very rugged. I mean you can't, yeah. you, you can't imagine it was made to look like California but it looks exactly yeah. like California. It's just the way it came out yeah. of the river. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank well, you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And if anything happened to that or didn't pick anything up, why? Something will work as long. <laughs>